Perhaps no war has become as politicized and outright lied about as the American Civil War. There seems to be more propaganda and century-old tradition out there than actual knowledge, for most people anyway. I hope to change some of that with this video. Welcome to the politically incorrect history of the Civil War. Here's what most people seem to know about the war. Basically just the boilerplate version they got when it was glossed over in public school or on the media. The North invaded the South to free the slaves. And that's it. No nuance, no real explanation or detail. Just that. And it's not even correct. But more on that later. First thing we need to do is define our terms. Was the Civil War really even a Civil War at all? No, I'm not going to go off on some preachy speech about how war is hell. I mean in terms of actual definition, was the Civil War, by definition, an actual Civil War at all? There are five basic types of wars, broadly speaking. You have traditional wars of conquest, revolutions, civil wars, wars of liberation, and police actions. So which is the American Civil War? Well, let's look at the obvious one first, the Civil War. The Civil War is two or more sides fighting for control of the same country. So does that definition fit? In the American Civil War, the South was not fighting to control the North or to control the Union government. They were fighting to be free from that government and to establish their own independent country. So, by definition, it is not and cannot be termed as a civil war. So, what was it then? Well, let's run through the list and see. If the South was fighting for independence, then the next logical choice would be a revolution, which is one or more groups fighting for independence from another country. But there's a problem. The South already technically achieved that. There was a brief period between succession and the start of the war where the South existed as an independent country. She even traded with the North. It was a very short time, to be sure, but it happened nonetheless. For it to be properly termed a revolution, the war should have begun immediately, but it did not. Therefore, it cannot properly be called a revolution either. So, what's left? Well, the North certainly was not trying to free the South from foreign occupiers, nor was it attempting a regime change. So it clearly was not a war of liberation, nor did it invade or enforce an international law, agreement, or accords, or wasn't a police action either. What does that leave them? or a traditional war of conquest. In a war of conquest, one or more countries invade another and attempt to seize its territory to be incorporated into their own and subjugate the population. Is that what happened? The North invaded the South, which was, at that time, a separate independent nation, with the goal of conquering it and forcing it back into the Union and subjugating its population. So it seems crystal clear, it was a war of conquest. So, what do we call it then, since the Civil War is clearly wrong? Of the popular names of the war, the one that seems to be most technically correct is the Old Southern Standby, the War of Northern Aggression, because that's what it was. Call it what you will, though, just don't call it a Civil War. What's next? Oh, right. The war is to free the slaves. That idea presupposes that the entirety of the slave states seceded, and that their primary motivation in doing so was to preserve slavery, and that the North invaded purely to free those slaves. But none of that is correct. First, not all the slave states succeeded. You heard that right. The North, the supposed freer of the slaves, had slaves. Specifically, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, and also West Virginia after it was created in 1863. So, if the North also held slaves... How could it be claimed that the North invaded the South to free the slaves? Why didn't it free its own then? And why would five slave states fight to free slaves? In fact, slaves in the North were not freed until well after the war when the 13th Amendment was ratified on December 6, 1865, eight months after the war ended. If the motivation of the North was to free the slaves, then shouldn't that have happened prior to the start of the war? And if the motivation of the South was purely to preserve slavery, then why fight at all when slavery was still perfectly legal and remained so throughout the war and after? 
Abraham Lincoln himself, in his first inaugural address on March 1st, 1863, said, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so. According to Lincoln, in his statement before Congress on July 4th, 1861, the war was a tax rebellion, and the North invaded a collective 40% excise tax on southern goods under the Memorial Tariff Act. Not slavery, taxes. Even when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamations on September 22, 1862 and January 1, 1863, he not only exempted the northern slaves, he offered the South three months to return to the Union and keep their slaves if he only paid the tax. He didn't even frame it as having anything to do with slavery, but rather, to quote him again, as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion. Prior to that, the Fugitive Slave Act was even still actively enforced. If an escaped southern slave were caught by northern troops, the slave would be detained and ultimately returned to their southern owner, hardly the actions of an army there to free the slaves. Even General Grant himself personally owned four slaves. So, what was the war over then, if not slavery? Why did the South succeed? For a large part, it was about exactly what Lincoln said it was about. Taxes. The South was deliberately targeted by unfair tariffs, but that was hardly the only reason. The South felt exploited by the industrialized North. The South was largely agricultural. Most factories were in the North, so the South depended on the North for most of its finished goods. To make matters worse, the North got the raw materials for those goods from the South, only to sell them back at a massive markup while paying very little for the raw materials. In short, there was a massive trade deficit. Then along comes the 40% tariff on top of that. In addition to economic pressure and resentment, there was a question of states' rights. Under the U.S. Constitution, states are supposed to be largely independent. The federal government controls trade and defense, but a state's internal operation was reserved to themselves. Article 1, Section 8 defines the role of federal government, and the Tenth Amendment reserves all the other power to the states and people, respectively. The North, however, preferred an intrusive federal government with subservient states. The South was opposed to that. Essentially, it's the same right versus left struggle that we continue to have today. Those who prefer a minimal government with high personal liberty versus those who want an all-powerful central government and limited personal freedom. The South simply felt the federal government was growing far too powerful and was infringing on the rights of the states under the principles of federalism enshrined in the Constitution, and they saw the election of Lincoln as a dangerous leap further in that direction. There was another issue as well with Lincoln's election. Though he was the clear winner of the Electoral College with 180 votes, when only 152 were needed, he only received about 40% of the popular vote, which wouldn't be so much of a problem if not for how the vote was divided geographically. Lincoln received no Southern support. He won due to carrying the more heavily populated Northern states while essentially ignoring their interests of the rest, leaving the South to feel he was imposed on them and questioning his legitimacy. In many ways, the hyperpolarization we see today was at play then as well. The difference was the clear geographic concentration. Put together with everything else, it was just too much, and it triggered the successions. Was slavery an issue? Was it a major part of the political discourse of the day and play a prominent role in the elections? Yes, but it was not the cause of the war. The actual cause, as I just explained, was much more complicated, and it really isn't due to one thing, but a collection of things. Yet, when asked what caused the war, most people seem to just give a canned one-word response. Slavery. It really is amazing. As a point of fact, slavery was just as unpopular in the South as it was in the North. For the South, it was a matter of economic necessity. Their economy was dependent on slavery, and that was changing, by the time of the war, it was still dependent. Slaves were also a major asset. Each one was about the same cost as an average house today when adjusted for inflation. It is a major reason why the practice was decreasing. But for the time, a slave would represent a significant portion of a family's assets. 
It is also worth noting that many southern slaves were actually owned by northern interests. It was precisely this unpopularity that drove the slave narrative. People were, and are, simply far more likely to support a war against something they see as wrong, like slavery, than something as unpopular as a war over taxes and the suppression of states' rights. Issues of the majority of people in the North actually agreed with the South on. So I have explained the succession and the motivations behind it, and the motivation of the North, but I have not yet described the actual cause of the war, the Cassus Belli. As I said, the war did not start right away. So what actually triggered it? Some of you may actually know this one. It was a shelling in Fort Sumter. What most people lack is the backstory. On December 6, 1860, Major Robert Anderson of the U.S. Army abandoned Fort Moultrie, which, as of six days earlier when South Carolina succeeded, was no longer a U.S.-owned fort, seeing the South Carolina fort which he was illegally occupying as indefensible against South Carolina state militia, he sabotaged the large cannons, which, like the fort, were owned by South Carolina, and burned the carriages. Then he stole the smaller cannons as he evacuated and trained them against civilian targets in Charleston, as he, acting without orders, illegally seized and occupied South Carolina on Fort Sumter, which was still under construction at the time. He then proceeded to squat at the fort, refusing to surrender to its lawful owners. Despite repeated demands by South Carolina's governor and General Beauregard, official protests were also sent to the U.S. federal government. Despite Anderson's illegal actions, the Union government not only refused to surrender the fort, but continued attempting to resupply and reinforce it, even though they had no legal claim or right to it. The Confederate government saw this, rightfully, as an act of war and threatened to dislodge the occupiers by force if they did not leave, issuing an ultimatum on April 11, 1861. Anderson refused to leave and stalled for time until 3 a.m. the next morning before finally announcing his intention to stay. So on April 12, 1861, at 4.30 in the morning, the Confederate batteries at Fort Johnson opened fire on Fort Sumter. The barrage lasted for 34 hours until Anderson finally surrendered. One Confederate artilleryman was killed along with two Union soldiers, and Anderson and his remaining troops were allowed to retreat to the north. The North deliberately orchestrated the event, knowing that the Confederates would eventually attack the fort. Despite this, and the fact that the Confederates had actually only shelled their own fort, and only after exhausting all their diplomatic options, the North used the event as justification for a full-scale invasion of the South to force it back to the Union, the will of the people and their elected representatives be damned. Pure Northern aggression and a federal drive for absolute unconstitutional supremacy over the states is what started the war. I hope that you've learned something that you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please like and subscribe and let me know your thoughts in the comment section. If you want to see more videos like this, please consider visiting my Patreon page in the link in the description. Everything helps, even if it's only a dollar or two, and I appreciate it all. Thank you.